Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you, yes, good morning. Thank you, my name is Ben Dworkin. I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. On behalf of the Rebovich Institute and Ryder University, welcome to our debate between the candidates for New Jersey's 12th Congressional District. Before I introduce the candidates, I'd like to review the debate format as well as the rules for the audience. The debate format will be as follows. Each candidate will give a two-minute opening statement. The order was picked this morning by a coin flip. I will then ask the first question. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer the identical question. This will be followed up by a discussion moderated by me that will last up to four minutes. At the end of the hour, each candidate will give a two-minute closing statement. Let me say here that we are thrilled with the public interest in this debate. Thank you again for coming. However, as we only have an hour and therefore we ask that aside from applause when the candidates come on stage and the applause at the conclusion of the debate, we ask that you all please remain quiet with the proper decorum befitting of a university setting. No outbursts or verbal reactions will be allowed of any kind. If you are unable to abide by these rules, we will have to ask you to leave the theater. Cheering, clapping, booing, similar behavior will simply take time away from hearing actual answers. Now, since this is the moment you can make noise, please join me in welcoming to the stage Representative Rush Holt, Democrat, and Mr. Eric Beck, Republican. Gentlemen, let us begin. In accordance with the coin toss, the first opening statement will be given by Mr. Beck. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ben and the, the representatives of the uh, uh, Rebovich Center and also my opponent for agreeing to do this debate today. You know, I'm 54 years old and I'm a lifelong resident of New Jersey. And uh, in that time, I don't think I've ever seen this state and this nation more divided than it is today. And it wasn't always that way. You know, I can remember a time when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill 25 years ago used to be able to sit down after a long day of political haggling and have a beer and tell a joke and share a laugh and part friends. And then they would go back at it the next day. And that was because back then the Democratic Party and the Republican Party had a common objective. And that objective was to create equal opportunity for all Americans. Well, today it's different, in my view. The Republican Party remains committed to creating equal opportunity for all Americans with a social safety net that does include health care for those who are most in need. But I think somewhere in the last 10 or so years, what we've seen is that the Democratic Party has been taken over by the progressive wing, the far left, and they have a new objective. And their objective is to achieve equal economic outcomes. And I believe when you look at equal opportunity and equal economic outcomes, those two objectives are irreconcilable. And that's why we're divided today. You know, Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, once told us, he said that if we put equality, including economic equality, before freedom, we'll get neither. But if we put freedom before equality, we'll get a high degree of both. And I hope you will agree with me that that should set the context for today's debate. Again, I want to thank Ben. I want to thank my opponent. And uh, let's, let's get started. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Please, no, we're not going to do that, OK? <laughs> Congressman Holt, your uh, opening statement. I, I thank uh, Ben and the Rebovich Center. I thank you all for coming, participating in the democratic process. Uh, I think in recent times debates have gotten a bad name. Uh, they've turned into uh, games uh, with short-term scoring opportunities uh, rather than opportunities to share a vision for the future and a discussion of the record. So I uh, thank Ben for setting up such a good program and, and I, I also thank uh, uh, Mr. Beck for 
taking part in, in this exchange. Um, I'm a teacher, a scientist by background. I, I like to make decisions on the basis of evidence rather than ideology. And I'm committed to the idea of representative government. If you call my office, we answer the phone, Representative Rush Holt. Um, it is because in all I do, and I will be happy to talk about, I hope I have an opportunity to talk about all the things that I have accomplished as representative, uh, but in all those things I do, I do it in the name of the people of, by, and for whom this constitutional system was created. So when we talk about education, uh, to be able to build the economy from the middle class, uh, from the middle out, when we talk about creating jobs, when we talk about social security and our uh, shared opportunities and shared benefits, when we talk about flood control or the other things that, uh, that I've worked on that we do together, um, it is all in the name of a broader benefit for the common good. This nation has not been built by saying, you're on your own. Uh, you, this nation has not been built by saying, I got mine, you get yours. Uh, we are a society first. Thank you, thank you very much, Congressman Holt. I for, neglected to mention in the beginning, and let me just sort of insert it here, Please turn off your cell phones so that no ringing, no buzzing that we're going to hear would distract the candidates. Thank you. The first question, again, determined by a coin choice, will be addressed to Mr. Beck. He will have two minutes to uh, answer. Congressman Holt will have two minutes to answer, and then we'll have a four-minute discussion. I'd like to talk about this looming fiscal cliff, Mr. Beck. One of the first challenges facing the new Congress will be this uh, what we expect to be huge cuts in military and domestic spending that are looming if an agreement on the budget cannot be reached. Now, some have argued that a deal can be found between the two parties if two things happen. Democrats have to agree to roll back the rate of growth in spending on entitlement programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and Republicans would need to be willing to increase tax rates on the nation's highest income earners. The question, sir, would you support this as the basis for a compromise in the Congress if you were elected? In some respects. I mean, clearly we've had a, a problem in this country, not with taxation, but with spending. And I think the major part of that problem has been the issue of entitlements over the years. Because if you look at the history of the last 30 years, what we've seen is a general trend in changes in the overall budget where we're spending more and more and more on such programs as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and they are important programs, no question about it. We're pressuring defense. We're, we're uh, actually we've gone from maybe 43% uh, of the federal budget for defense in 1960 now down to 19%, and it appears to be shrinking. So the pressure is um, coming from the, uh, the spending side, but it's primarily from the, uh, the entitlements. Um, with regard to taxation, let me say this. Um, the history of taxation and tax proposals and, and budget agreements, at least for the last 30 years, has been every time we've had a budget agreement. This goes back to Ronald Reagan. It goes back to the, 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 the George Bush Sr., uh, you know, read my lips, no new taxes agreement. Every time that we've raised taxes, that money has never been used for deficit reduction. It's always been used to justify higher spending. And you, the agreements that were made by Ronald Reagan during the 1980s and the George Bush agreement um, I think we st should still be holding the Democratic Party, even though they're, we're talking about 20 years later, we should be holding them accountable for that. Because I don't believe for one second that if we agree to a budget deal that's going to include spending cuts and tax increases, that we're going to see the spending cuts that we would hope to have. We're going to see the tax increases, but not the spending cuts. Congressman, uh, the question about is there a potential for an agreement here? Uh, of course, uh, there must be. Uh, this country uh, traditionally has kept uh, income and outgo in some balance. They are out of balance now. Uh, it's not a healthy situation. But the unhealthiest, the least healthy part of this situation is how we got to this so-called fiscal cliff created by the sequestration threat. Um, a year and a half ago, the Republican leadership in uh, Congress refused to pay our debts. First time in American history. Now we've had, 
You know, this country has had debts for all but a couple of years of our entire history, going back to the American Revolution. But we've always paid down our debts. And then they said, no, we won't do it unless you deal with the deficit. But we won't let you deal with the deficit in any responsible way by looking at the both sides of the ledger. You must deal with it only through cuts. Well, it's because uh, that, as we heard from Mr. Beck, they regard Medicare and Social Security as problems. You'll notice that's the word he used. I don't see those as problems. I see those as important programs that tie this country together. And we can deal with the income and the outgo if we do it in a responsible way. And we don't put anything off the table, but we have to, first of all, look at, at the revenue we collect, or so-called taxes, not as uh, something that is onerous or punitive, but, as Holmes said, the cost of civilization. It is how we do these things to help each other. It is how we support Medicare, Social Security, food programs, yes, investment in research, blood control, education, and, and defense, <coughs> and, and, okay. uh, and uh, uh, public order. Why don't, we, thank why don't you. we, thank you. Why don't we continue now with the discussion? Because the Congressman raised an, uh, an issue that I had not specifically cited, and that was this, the debate over the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. Mr. Beck, many in the Republican Party uh, chose not to uh, support an increase in the debt ceiling in this past Congress, which en ended up with this sequestration mm -hmm. situation. Can you talk about your views on raising the debt ceiling and what you uh, would have done had you been there, what you will do, because certainly that's going to come up again. Well, of course you know that most industrialized countries don't have a debt ceiling, uh, but that, they also, that also leads them to have a lot of fiscal problems where they spend more money than we, they, they should. However, I will say with regard to working towards an, a, a long-term budget agreement, I would support the idea of increasing the debt ceiling on a temporary basis, only on a temporary basis, just to give us enough breathing room so we can have a negotiated settlement on that. So I don't really have, I'm, I'm not an absolutist on it, but I do believe that we have to live within our means. We are spending too much money, uh, we have set too many priorities, we've underfunded them, and then what happens is, what we see from the left, they cry poverty, and they raise, want to raise taxes on the wealthy. Ultimately what happens is, you don't get the money from the wealthy, and let they me, always come back and they tax the middle class. That's let me turn back to Congressman Holt uh, here. In a sense, um, one of the things that, again, helped us get into this situation is the ongoing debate over the Bush-era tax cuts, on particularly those that applied to the highest income earners. They were extended for uh, two years. Uh, there are those who would argue if uh, you simply allowed them to expire, much of our, uh, a big chunk of the deficit problem would be handled. Can you talk about your view in relation to uh, Mr. Beck on the Bush era tax cuts, would you allow them? Should they be continued? Should they be extended temporarily? Should they be allowed to expire? What's your uh, thought on that? Well, the, the principal reasons for, our, for the imbalance between our income and outgo right now are those tax cuts. Um, they were um, economically unwise, and the data are there to show that they didn't produce the desired results. Uh, and continuing them would only dig us deeper into, uh, uh, into imbalance. We have proposed extending the tax cuts to the middle class. And, and by the way, I want to point out in the last few years, uh, I supported, the president proposed, we passed into law, we implemented the largest middle class tax cut in history. Um, the idea now of extending the Bush era tax cuts for the middle class is something that the Republicans say they want, the Democrats have proposed, and we can't get it done because of the kind of intransigence that the Republican leadership has brought about uh, in, in the House. Um, we have said, okay, let's continue to argue about whether we should have a tax cut for the higher income, the top 2% of income earners. 
but let's go ahead with the tax cut for the middle class. Let's do that, and we'll continue to argue about let what me, we disagree with, and they wouldn't let that happen. So, let me, so Mr. Um, Beck sounds very reasonable right now, but there is no room in the current leadership, in the current majority, in the House of Representatives, for any reason. Let me turn to, so Mr. Beck, uh, there are sort of two parts to this discussion here. One is, do you see uh, the current Republican leadership in the House as contributing to this intransigence that you even raised in, in your opening statement? And more specifically, just for you, sir, are there circumstances in this debt agreement in which you would agree to extending or, or letting those uh, Bush era tax cuts expire? Uh, let me take that as two parts. First of all, with regard to the Republican leadership, um, I, as far as I know, they have supported for the longest period of time uh, comprehensive tax reform that would hopefully increase revenues um, by changing the, the form of the tax code. And with regard to the Bush area tax cuts, I'm not saying I'm going to support or oppose the Bush area tax cuts because I don't think that's the issue. The issue is the fact that we have a tax code that is inefficient and ineffective and needs to be scrapped because it, it's basically uh, um, a conglomeration of special interest uh, initiatives that are economically efficient. They put us at a competitive disadvantage relative to other industrialized nations. I have talked mm -hmm. about a three-point economic plan. One of the points that I've, I've talked about uh, as I've gone around the district is the need for a flat tax, a 15% flat tax. Let me, uh, because we've ex ex exhausted our time, okay. we're going to try and get through, to, we'll, we'll be other economic questions. Sure. So let me hold uh, us there. I do want to uh, shift now um, in our hour together uh, to another uh, topic, um, and that is that one of the effects of redistricting in this past uh, 2010 following the census was that the entire city of Trenton is now within the borders of this 12th congressional uh, district. Uh, Mr. Holt, you get to answer this one uh, first. So as has been the case for the last 100 years or so, our nation's cities have experienced the, the full brunt of the recession, but even more so. Many urban areas are facing significant additional challenges, such as the lack of investment, crime, poverty, inadequate educational systems. As I said, the 12th Congressional District now includes, includes the entire city of Trenton, which faces many of these challenges. What would be the most significant way Congress can help cities like Trenton? Um, thanks. Uh, you know, it, it has been my honor and privilege to represent uh, most of Trenton for the past uh, decade. Uh, it's been divided between two congressional districts, as, as you uh, refer to, and uh, starting in January, and based on this November's election, all of Trenton will be in the 12th Congressional District. Uh, I hope to have the opportunity to represent uh, all of Trenton. Leaders in Trenton, uh, offici uh, elected officials and other community leaders, will tell you they have not had such attentive representation as they have had from me in the last 10 years uh, in recent memory. Uh, I'm very pleased to represent Trenton, I've worked hard to help Trenton address it, uh, her many problems. What can the federal government do uh, is what we should be doing for cities all over the country, but also suburbs all over the country. Uh, we need to pay attention to education. It is the answer to almost every question. Uh, we need to pay attention to education so that the people of Trenton have a, that they see a way forward uh, economically and in their quality of life. We have to create jobs, best not done indirectly through some sort of trickle-down tax policy, best done directly. If you want to create jobs, create jobs. Um, by providing health care broadly, Medicaid, Medicare, um, that is of benefit to the entire society, but especially uh, to the urban areas. And one of the things the Affordable Care Act does is put a lot of emphasis, emphasis on federally qualified health centers and other, other urban health centers. And finally, investment in infrastructure. It is particularly cities like Trenton that have crumbling infrastructure oh, yeah. where, that we should invest in repairing. Thank you. Mr. Beck, the question about how Congress can help Trenton. 
Well, I think there is a limit to what Congress can do to help Trenton, primarily because if you look at the current situation in Trenton with the local government, they are in the middle of a, a major corruption scandal, and there is a real problem in trying to uh, restore stability of the local government. Uh, we've seen turnover in the, in the, in the uh, police department. We've seen uh, Mayor Mack now being arrested by the FBI and some of his cohorts. Um, Trenton, we can help Trenton to some degree. Uh, I know the congressman has appropriated a certain amount of funds for police officers uh, to try and uh, help secure the streets of Trenton. Problem is, when you're running trillion dollar deficits, that kind of support can't go on forever. It's gonna end someday. And what is Trenton gonna be left with? Ultimately, Trenton's problems have to be solved by the people of Trenton. Because the federal government, unless you're gonna have a takeover of the city or the state takeover of the city, there has to be a credible government, local government, that's going to uh, establish some stability and encourage and give people confidence to invest with private money. Federal money, government money is not the way to sustain growth and prosperity in Trenton. It's gotta come through private investment. We've seen that in New Brunswick. We've seen it under Cory Booker, actually, in Newark. Once we had a, a changeover and had uh, a uh, leadership, uh, I, I give him credit for at least not being a corrupt individual. Um, he's been able to attract private investment and uh, uh, Newark has benefited. So, but we need, to, we need to talk to the people of Trenton and say, look, the federal government has a limit in terms of what it can do to help you. You've got to take ownership of your own city, your own government, and fix the problems first, and then we can work together to improve the situation there. Congressman, how would you, how do you respond to those who would argue, as Mr. Beck did, that there's a limit to what the federal government can do? Well, it seems to me that Mr. Beck's uh, watchword, his basic theme is you're on your own. You're on your own Trentonians, you're on your own Trenton. Um, I'm reminded of the headline in the New York Daily News about 40 years ago. Uh, President, this was uh, Ford to City, drop dead. Um, there are things we can do, and I really uh, have to react strongly to this fairly dismissive comment about the COPS program. The community-oriented community policing program has been good for this country. It has been good for the urban areas, and yes, it's been good for Trenton. It's true, uh, the number of layoffs in Trenton have are far exceed the number of police who have been hired under the COPS program. We've, we've got to do better, but to dismiss that as an unaffordable, unsustainable federal program is to deny Trenton the help that it needs for me, uh, order and safety. So let me uh, shift, yeah, Mr. Beck, you want to respond? Yeah, I want to I say, uh, look at the philosophy you're preaching. It's as if the federal government is ultimately responsible for the success of Trenton. That's what I'm hearing as, as I'm listening to the congressman. And the fact is, that's not the case. That's not how we organize democracy in this country. The people of Trenton are ultimately accountable and responsible for stabilizing their own government and creating their own prosperity. The federal government can help, the state government can help, but it's help. It's not solving the problem. It's something that the people of Trenton have to address primarily. Let me, uh, no, Congressman, you had mentioned education in the first part of uh, your answer, and the federal government, at least over the last 45, 50 years, has taken an active federal role in uh, education. A growing number of families in urban centers are looking for vouchers as some way to help their child get out of a system uh, that they feel is failing them. Can, why don't we shift to that in terms of urban education? Do you believe that the federal government should be supporting vouchers in order to help those parents in a place like Trenton who feel their child needs to, they need some kind of financial support from the government in order to move uh, their child to a different school? Uh, uh, let me repeat, there are things, important things we can do from the federal government to help Trenton and cities like Trenton prosper. Uh, it is not a matter of you're on your own, you work it out. Um, yes, it costs taxpayer money, but there is such a thing as investment. I, I know my opponent and lots of people in Washington are dismissing the idea of investment as wasteful spending. No, there, when you put money into America, into education, into infrastructure. It makes us a richer, more prosperous, more productive country. It pays back many times over. And uh, 
the GI Bill is a perfect example because it's a nice, uh, something that's easy to understand. But in so many ways, this is repeated over and over again. And so uh, although federal aid to education is not great uh, nationwide, uh, the federal government share of education is only eight or nine percent. Here in New Jersey, even less than that. Uh, still, through the Title I programs, through the school lunch programs, through the after school programs, through the Head Start programs, uh, we oh. put, we make investments that make this a more productive, richer let me, uh, uh, future. Okay, let me, so let me shift it, Mr. Beck, so you sure. can uh, address some of the things he said as well as the voucher question. Yeah, well, I, uh, oh, yeah, uh, well, sorry, I. Sorry, we'll get we'll to that. Come back to the voucher <laughs> question in a minute, but I just want to comment on this, yeah. this point about investment. Yeah, investment is a, is a great idea. Um, the problem is that what we've seen, particularly in the last four years, as we've watched and observed um, investment as it's been defined by the administration and, and supported by my opponent, is that investment tends to be um, sometimes things that aren't investments, like Solyndra. We've also heard mm -hmm. government officials talk about investment as like the bridge to nowhere. Investments from the government perspective can be positive because there are some investments that the private sector will not do. But okay. they can oft often be wasteful as well. Thank you. Uh, sort of, we're, we're doing, our, doing our best to sort of balance time in this discussion, so. I, I, I can say in 10 seconds about vouchers. Uh, sure, we, but then I want to make sure he answers we, specifically we, the voucher right, question. We, sure. we, sure. we want to uh, uh, encourage public education. There's some federal support that can be done for that. The, the problem with vouchers is that it tends to take funds away from those places that need them most. And that hurts the children uh, more than, uh, uh, well, more than it helps them. Sure, and Mr. Beck, just a few mo moments. Not, not uh, if you're targeting them to inner city kids who are disadvantaged because they're in failing schools. So I don't see how that's a problem. Look, I think there's room for experimentation with new accountability models in schools. I'm supporting the governor's uh, initiatives to move beyond No Child but Left Behind and to look at, at more uh, uh, new and, and more innovative ways for accountability. But also, I do support the idea of experimenting with vouchers. We can find ways to make okay. that work, uh, for particularly for kids who are okay. disadvantaged. Thank you for both being able to address that relatively quickly. Um, the next question, the third question, uh, will begin with Mr. Beck. Uh, and I wanted to just go to shift to foreign affairs for a moment. Many people were quite excited to see new governments emerging across the Arab world over the past year. The question for you is, what should United States policy be towards pro-democracy uprisings in the Arab world? Well, uh, it's been an interesting uh, set of observations in the last couple, couple years uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the Arab Spring. Um, I, I've traveled in the Middle East. I've spent some time trying to understand the perspective of some of the people who, who live in that part of the world. I've got a very good friend who is an Egyptian national who has dual citizenship and spends a lot of time in Egypt trying to understand uh, the situation there. Um, America's policy should be to support Americans, America's values and to support democracies that are willing to share and implement on a broad basis America's values. And in some cases it's going to be years before we see the potential benefits of this. Egypt is a really good example because in the last presidential election um, we had uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood who had about 20 percent support. We had the remnants of the Mubarak administration had 20% support, and we had about 60% of the people in Egypt that were in splintered liberal parties. And uh, what happened was, in the, after the election, we saw that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood gained control of the presidency and most of their, their parliament in Egypt. Um, what's happened since then is that the liberal parties have consolidated. So four years from now, when you have a presidential election, what you're gonna see is that the liberal parties are going to have the majority of the vote. And most likely, they will gain the presidency if that holds, if it holds. So we should support, to the degree that we are observing migration and, and proceeding to a, a democratic regime, we should support countries like Egypt. 
with limited military support because it is the military that is pro-Western and they are doing their best at this point to reinforce <coughs> the need for an open and fair democracy. And I think as long as they're working towards that, um, I think we should continue to support uh, Egypt and other nations for doing the same. Congressman, your question, uh, the question about Arab, excuse me, United States policy towards pro-democracy uprisings in the Arab world. Uh, thanks, Ben. And Mr. Beck presents, I, I think, a, a reasonable uh, uh, position here. Uh, how can the country of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams not support people who are trying to overthrow despots and tyrants? We must. We owe it to them. We owe it to ourselves and to the values we hold dear. Of course, there is some trade there between predictability and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and freedom and democracy. But we have to side with freedom and democracy. Uh, it's causing <coughs> some short-term headaches for us right now. Uh, but we have to continue to stand with uh, our friends. Uh, for, we have to stand with democracy and human rights. Um, we have to be engaged actively, uh, diplomatically, and we have to be engaged actively economically for those countries that are going the right direction. Uh, uh, we have to hold fast with uh, our longtime friends, for example, in that region, Israel, um, and we have to uh, part with those who uh, uh, get off the path. Uh, you know, for a while it looked like President Assad was in, in Syria was going to be unlike his father. Uh, he's become more, more, <laughs> he's taken his father to an extreme here. And we have to part company. Uh, we, and so, uh, uh, yes, uh, we should be engaged uh, to promote human rights and democracy, as Mr. Beck is saying. Mr. Beck, so let's... The congressman raised the issue of Syria, so why don't we talk about that because it's sure. a very different situation than the Egypt example. Um, the crackdown by the Assad government has been particularly harsh, mm -hmm. um, according to news reports. Are American forces working through NATO or the UN needed on the ground in Syria in order to protect civilians? No. We're not going to put American forces on the ground in Syria, period. I don't believe that's a, a correct approach. Our, our goal in Syria should be stability to the extent we can achieve it. Um, the Syrian government has had, um, has had uh, support from the Soviet Union, who's largely interested in a, uh, a naval port that they have on the Mediterranean there. That's where their interests are. And I think what you're going to see over time, as I talk to people in that part of the region, you're going to see an evolution of the existing Syrian government um, migrating towards geographically towards that port, and hopefully We'll, so, we'll, we'll so what should we be doing uh, I, I think in order we, to support the transition I to I think democracy. what we should be doing, what, probably what we should have been doing in Libya, and I, uh, to be honest with you, I can't see why we didn't do this in Libya, but what we should be trying to do is draw a dividing line between the two sides and seek both sides to end the fighting. Um, I don't think we should be taking sides in, in that, uh, in that uh, conflict. I don't think we should have done it in Libya. Um, but I think if we had uh, stabilized uh, both, both countries by trying to at least, in, uh, in effect, uh, draw a demilitarized zone between the, the, the two sides, okay. enforced by a no-fly zone, I think uh, that should be the limit of what we, we try and get so into. So, Congressman, so we've now brought up a couple things. The Syria question, what should the United States be doing? And if you want to touch on the Libya uh, issue, whether that is analogous or not, please do. Uh, we should continue to do what we are doing uh, for Syria. Sec sec uh, with mm -hmm. regard to Syria. Secretary of State Clinton is heavily involved there. Um, the, uh, the United Nations uh, is involved, not in the way that NATO was involved in, uh, in Libya, uh, but is getting more and more involved and uh, pressure against the Assad regime uh, is uh, is growing and becoming unbearable for for him. Um, so I, I think that's Keep what in mind, do. what the congressman is advocating, yeah. those who are saying we should support the rebels and oppose the side, they are supporting a group of individuals who we have not been able to decipher 
whether or not they agree with us or disagree with us. Many of them are, are Islamists, radical Islamists. So what we're saying here is that the policy of the administration has been to support um, uh, the, the rebels in that area, hopefully to push the Assad regime out, and we might very well see that replaced with a, ra a radical Islamic regime. So, so yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that we can be taking sides here. I think our, our, our core should be stability in that region and trying to end the conflict to the extent we can. Congressman, so let me try and frame this so that we can understand a distinction here. Uh, in what way should the United States policy determine we want to be supportive of people who want to overthrow a tyrant, yet we're worried what will replace it? How do, how do values dictate which one, or it should be a more of a we're not taking sides, hands off approach? What is, what's your view on this? Well, let's, you know, as I say, I always like to look at evidence. Let's look at the historical evidence. Uh, you, you'll be hard pressed to find examples of where it has worked out well when the United States supported dictators. Uh, it is it just, you know, you uh, sow a wind, you reap a whirlwind. Um, whether, it's, uh, whether it's Iran or, uh, uh, or Egypt, uh, it is uh, over, the, over the long term, it does not come out well if we make that our foreign policy. Thank you. The next question, we're going to be jumping back uh, to economic policy, and this will be first directed to Congressman Holt. Unemployment in New Jersey is now nearly 10%. Jobs are clearly on the minds of most voters. Congressman, what can government actually do to decrease the unemployment rate? Well, as I said earlier, uh, the jobs uh, are a... And a, a, a critical problem for us now, the foremost problem, both economically and socially. Uh, the damage to our social fabric is something that's often overlooked uh, in discussions of the unemployment rate. Um, there have been gains, and we have to remember that. Nobody is happy with the current economic situation. Nobody is happy with a national 7.8% <laughs> Uh, unemployment rate. It is better. It is improving. Um, but we have to recognize that you know, millions of jobs have been created in part through the economic stimulus and in part through other activities to encourage uh, uh, energy production and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, we, we can and we should be uh, gener uh, creating jobs. The best way to do it is directly, not indirectly. The idea that we're going to create jobs by, uh, well, extending the Bush tax cuts, for example, uh, and somehow the job creators will get enough money that they will hire and the benefits will trickle down just demonstrably has not worked. It did not work with the Bush tax cuts. It hasn't worked with previous tax cuts. You could go back to John F. Kennedy in the 60s and uh, make an argument that, yes, some jobs and some economic activity were created, um, maybe. Uh, but that is, uh, you're, you're hard pressed to find evidence that that will work. The stimulus did work, demonstrably. Millions of jobs. Yes, I understand, it cost money, and some of that had to be borrowed. But the alternative of economic collapse would have been much more expensive. Let me turn yeah. to, uh, we talk about government and uh, a government's role in, in helping uh, lower the unemployment rate. Yeah, and, and what you're hearing from the congressman is basically free lunch economics. He's running on the Paul Krugman economic plan, which basically says that if we borrow as much as we can and spend as much as we can, we'll be a prosperous society. Let me, let me point out, there, was a, there were several estimates of how much it cost for each job created and saved by the stimulus program that the president proposed. The most conservative of those estimates was that it cost 278,000 tax dollars for every job created or saved, or every job created, I should say. Do you know what the average median income is for the average job in this country? It used to be 55,000. Now it's about 50,000 because it's dropped about 4,500 during the course of the last four years. So what you're saying is we created jobs by spending $278,000 for, for every, on average, $55,000 a year job. 
That is the defini definition of economic inefficiency. It is wasteful. It is the destruction of wealth. I do not believe what we've heard from this administration in any way reflects what might be classically called Keynesian economic stimulus. In fact, they have violated every possible rule of what John Maynard Keynes taught us about how to stimulate the economy. First of all, he said that we should never spend money as a stimulus on top of existing structural deficits. And when we are in recovery mode, we should be running a surplus. Now, we've been in recovery technically since June of 2009. I have yet to see a federal surplus in all that time. In fact, what Keynes taught us was we should be encouraging private sector investment, not public sector investment, because he knew that was the only way to achieve sustainable job growth. So I don't know where my opponent learned economics. You're, you're, I mean, you're a great rocket scientist. I love that line. Let, let's not line. address each other directly like that. Let's. Okay. Let's what I'm saying is that this is not consistent with any credible economic theory that I've seen out there in all, over the years. Congress well, you want to I, I, I guess he wants to talk about the issue of the stimulus. Put uh, anyone, put yourself in the shoes of the president uh, in in the months before he took office and on the month of the first month of his uh, of his administration, uh, losing eight hundred thousand jobs per month. Nobody really even understood what a deep hole we were in. There was a deficit, it turns out, of about eight million jobs. And the economy was going south fast. It may be that the stimulus was not as efficient as some theoretical Adam Smith might, uh, might like to see, uh, but there was no alternative. A tax cut was not going to create jobs. We tried that. It didn't work. It hasn't worked. It won't work. Uh, and in fact, what, what, uh, what the president did, inefficient as it may be, worked to the tune of nearly 5 million jobs uh, with a deficit of 8 million. So it's not good enough. Uh, but. Uh, it had to be done, and it, I will repeat, the alternative of having the bottom fall out would have been much more expensive, much less efficient, uh, and with huge so human let costs. Me, okay, so let yeah. me get to the straight. At that time, and we're now harkening back to history, mm -hmm. in January of 2009, yep. the new president come in, and we remember Lehman in September and, and where we were as an economic, was there, uh, is there an alternative that you would have proposed? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, let me just say that if you'll remember back to that period of time, what happened was uh, President Bush handed President Obama on a silver platter something called TARP. It was agreed to on a bipartisan basis. It was a stabilization package for the financial uh, industry. And he picked that up and uh, helped to implement it. And that's what stabilized the economy. And we were in recovery by June of that year, so only five months later. Um, so with, with regard to what we should have done at that point, keep in mind, you may have heard the, the, the fact that on the corporate books today, there's about $2 trillion, $2 trillion of cash on hand amongst American corporations sitting there waiting out this president. It's sitting in cash. It's not being invested because they don't know, they don't have any clarity in terms of the future direction of the regulatory environment, additional burdens like Obamacare that was put on them. Um, they are very uncertain about the future. And all the studies show this. The National Federation so of Independent Business as well. And the goal should have been to figure out a way to provide them the confidence, involve them in the process so that we could free up private money, which is the only way to invest private so, money to okay. create sustainable job creation. So I want to I get the Congressman's take on that particular issue, the, the notion that corporations have trillions of dollars on their books that are not currently investing. Fact, fact. They have trillions of dollars. They're sitting on it. I would say that. To that what it, do you. I would say it's unpatriotic this? that they are not doing that. Um, the, uh, the idea that they're waiting for certainty is nonsense. No, yes, it's true. They're waiting for the end of the Obama administration, some of them. Uh, uh, but I think that's irresponsible business. Uh, the president has provided plenty of certainty, plenty of direction. Um, it is the leadership in Congress that has been intransigent. 
And you know, Mr. Mr. Beck may try to distance himself from that, uh, but the fact is, there are no Republicans in the House of Representatives where Mr. Beck wants to sit who are going away from John Boehner and Eric Cantor. They are in lockstep in an intransigent position okay. to defeat President Obama. Okay, let us uh, shift uh, again. Um, and this first, the question is gonna go first to uh, Mr. Beck. Recent court decisions by the United States Supreme Court uh, made it, seemingly made it much easier for wealthy individuals to spend tremendous sums of money in our elections. This year, more money is gonna be spent in this presidential campaign than at any other time in the history of the Republic. Do you believe that contributing to a political campaign is a form of personal speech and should therefore be accorded all the rights uh, of free speech? If it's a direct campaign contribution, yes, I think that's the case. Uh, but I do share um, your concerns with regard to how money is raised and how it is spent. Um, I've been trying to decipher a way of, of uh, a solution that we could focus on, one thing that we could point to to improve the situation. I'm not concerned about how much money is being spent in politics, I'm really not. I'm concerned <laughs> about how it's raised and how it's being spent. Um, I, I, uh, the Currently, as I have experienced it in this campaign, and uh, just in watching the numbers, uh, there's two things that are of concern. One is political action committee money. 85% of political action committee money goes to reinforce incumbency. And if you're a believer in term limits and all that, you should be thinking about how do we modify the, the, the rules around political action committees and how they dispense money. I felt that what we could do is require them to distribute 50% of the money to incumbents and 50% to challengers. I think that's something that we should test constitutionally, try and do it legislatively. Um, I think that's certainly reasonable. I also know, because we've looked at my, my opponent's uh, campaign records, he has received a ton of money from labor unions. You know, it's interesting, I grew up in a, a labor house. My father was a teamster for the last 15 years of his working career. And uh, I'm not pro-union or pro-management, I'm pro-competition actually, but you know, the, the unions have the right to coerce their employees into giving money, um, and they give it largely to candidates to the left. And it seems to me that they should be living under the same rules as all of us, they should give it voluntarily. Uh, I've given money to polit polit political action committees for companies I've worked for in the past. I've done it voluntarily, I was never coerced to do it. Um, I think unions ought to live under the same rule. Well, there, yeah, the, the there, question there, was, uh, uh, just to remind there. us, that yes. the, the original question was about, is a campaign contribution free speech? Um, it shouldn't be. Uh, under the Buckley ruling and a number of family of rulings there, um, uh, the Supreme Court has allowed restrictions on contributions until recently, but not restrictions on spending. Now recently they've lifted the limits uh, or the restrictions on contributions, saying that even corporations uh, are like people in, uh, uh, in uh, having the freedom to spend as speech in campaigns. Uh, a terrible way to go. Uh, the first day I was in Congress, I sat down with uh, the authors of the Shays, Meehan, and McCain-Feingold legislation to say, I want to enlist in the effort to uh, have real campaign finance reform. That should include restrictions on contributions, uh, restrictions on how, it, how those contributions are spent. Um, so far we have had only partial success in that. Uh, nevertheless, for myself, I'm pleased that what I've done to pay for the communication that's necessary in a campaign is to have a very broad donor base. I have 20 some thousand uh, contributors to my uh, campaign efforts. And I, I don't, I, there are very few members of Congress who have such a broad base. And I do that as a matter of principle um, and uh, will, con will continue to do that. Uh, as for organized labor, um, I'm very strongly in favor of the right to organize for all sorts of reasons. This was important legislation from the 1930s. It should not be watered down. Yes, they do tend to support 
uh, legislators who support such things as occupational safety legislation and regulations, or mine safety regulations, okay. or the li Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Yes, okay. I voted for that, and unions appreciate that. Okay. Let me, um, as part of our now this follow-up discussion, gentlemen, I wanted to just get back to something you said, Mr. Uh, Beck, mm -hmm. um, because you were, I just wanted, if you could clarify for all of us, you talked about free speech, the campaign, con direct campaign contributions should be free speech. You then suggested that one way of dealing with some of the issues would be to require PACs to divvy up their contributions between incumbents and uh, challengers. Wouldn't that violate a person's free speech by no. requiring them to no. give to someone? Let me, make, let me draw the distinction between Please. an individual giving a donation to a particular candidate. I think that should be unrestricted. I don't even have a concern about giving, giving money, in, uh, putting caps on that, although that may be something that we decide to do. I, I'm not that concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is somebody who's giving money to an interest. I used to work for a company called Beneficial Corporation. They had something called BenPAC. They used to encourage us to donate money to their political action committee. I didn't know who it was going to. It went to Democrats and Republicans, ultimately, from what I saw the list. But they're representing an interest, okay? And the fact is that uh, because they're not a human being, they're not people, all right? And I don't believe they should be viewed as people. The corporations or their political action committee shouldn't have the right to vote because they're not mm -hmm. people, right? Um, I think it's reasonable to put restrictions on how the money is distributed from a political action committee. And just over the years, in trying to figure out what would be the next best thing short of modifying the Constitution, which would limit our right to freedom of speech, would be to, to require them legislated to distribute the money between incumbents and challenges evenly. Let me shift back to the Congressman, because Mr. Beck then raises the issue of the Constitution, whether it needs to be changed, given that the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted it uh, currently. Would you support a constitutional amendment to overturn and reverse decisions like Citizens United? Is that something that you would agree with? Uh, the Citizens United decision and some associated decisions uh, defining corporations as people for the purposes of political uh, contributions is so bad and will have such anti-democratic uh, effects for years to come if I don't see an opportunity to overturn that decision, and I don't, uh, I would support an amendment to the Constitution. I am very loath to amend our Constitution. It has worked so well for so long. Uh, you know, uh, only a couple dozen amendments over two centuries, um, and including the Bill of Rights. Uh, we should not do that lightly, but this is a true affront to the democratic process. Let me ask, what about the same question for you? Would you support a constitutional amendment to overturn these recent Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United? I, I would be open to the idea, providing I see the language and can agree to it, because I, I am also loath to restrict freedom of speech. So I, I would need to see the text of that, that, that amendment and, and see what it's really trying to accomplish and, and what are the unintended consequences of it. Anytime we modify the Constitution, we ought to be very, very, very cautious. That's why I'm saying I think the next step in this process would be something legislatively if we could achieve it, and I just happen to propose that one way. Okay. Why don't we move on uh, to the next topic, the few minutes we have uh, left, and I wanted to make sure we touched on Social Security because it obviously affects lots of people in the district. With baby boomers beginning to retire, uh, the demands on our nation's Social Security system are expected to dramatically increase. Congressman Holt, this goes first to you. What do you believe government should be doing to ensure the solvency of our Social Security system? Uh, first of all, the Social Security system is not in deep trouble. Uh, my, my colleague, my uh, mm -hmm. uh, opponent has said uh, various times that it is. Please understand, the way things are now, uh, for the next uh, two or three decades, no one will receive less than 100% of their full benefits if we make no changes to the system. If the population of the country grows as best we can tell, and if the economy grows at a slow rate, but if it grows at a faster rate, uh, if uh, immigration adds more to our productivity, uh, for example, uh, that 
that date where it would pay less than 100% recedes. It could recede by decades. Um, still, uh, after that period, if nothing changes, uh, Social Security could still pay about 77% of full benefits. Now, 77% is not 100%. We need to fix it. It can be fixed by a, and politically it will require getting together probably in the way that it was done in the early 80s, uh, the, the Ball Commission, um, so that there's some changes to the income, some changes to the outgo. It should be part of a package. Uh, just to put this in perspective, the, the fiscal problems that Social Security faces over the projected future now are comparable to the fiscal problems that were faced by Social Security into the projected future back in the early 1980s. Those were fixed with fairly minor, now we accept, changes to uh, the income and the outgo. So uh, similar steps could put Social Security on unquestionable financial foot footing for the lifetime of any toddler alive today. And we should do it because it is that important, one of the most important programs of American government. Mr. Beck, the question about what do we need to do to ensure the solvency of Social Security? Okay. Well, first of all, I, and my opponent said that Social Security is not in deep trouble, but ask yourself what's happened between 1983 and today. I mean, why is it that we have $8 trillion in unfunded liabilities, promises made to current and future seniors we have no money to pay for? And that's largely because politicians get their hands on this money and they spend it. It isn't in a trust fund. It's not in an individual account where your money that you're contributing is going to your, an individual account. So the way Social Security is being managed has to be fixed over the long term. But in the short term, we've got to get the projection of Social Security revenues on track with benefits paid and eliminate that $8 trillion in unfunded liabilities. And, and to do that, we've got to move towards, for um, not for current se seniors or, or those who are about to retire, but we have to start looking at pushing back the retirement age. The problem with, with Social Security is largely demographics, and we can do that relatively easily. And again, with, on, on a bipartisan basis, I agree with my opponent, it's going to require bipartisan support to start pushing back the retirement age uh, for those who are 55 and younger. And by the way, that includes me. So I'm the one that's going to get hurt here a little bit. So, um, uh, but I, I just, I can't bring myself to say Social Security is not in deep trouble. It's been in trouble for a long time. And uh, that's why we're in the mess we're in today relative to 1983. So Congressman, what about this question about raising the retirement age? Is that something you would agree with? Uh, uh, let me say that uh, Mr. Beck continues to describe Social Security as a problem. Uh, just as earlier he described Medicare as a problem. I don't see these as problems. I see these as great accomplishments of the United States of America. And the question is, uh, can we keep them available uh, as important as they are for people for generations to come? The answer is a resounding yes, we can. We don't need to privatize it. Uh, we don't need to change the eligibility dramatically. I did say that in order to make the fairly minor adjustments that need to be made, there probably should be changes to the income and changes to the outgo. But uh, that so the, the, uh, among those things that might be considered mm -hmm. would be uh, uh, retirement age, would be uh, the, the cap on uh, FICA eligible taxable income, um, as well as, uh, uh, well, other things. Okay. But it is not, it shouldn't be picked apart and say this thing only and not that thing. This has to be put together as a package. Sure. Uh, now, Mr. Beck, let me shift. I mean, Social Security obviously involves discussions about all kinds of entitlements. And I want to get back to Medicare for a sure. second because that's such a um, uh, controversial, not controversial, but debatable issue uh, in, the, in the current climate. Uh, let me ask it this way. Should younger Americans, since we're here in front of a college audience and a college setting, should younger Americans start planning now to receive less in Medicare uh, payments? That is, there'll be less coverage when we get older, and if not, how is it going to be protected? Well, I, I, I think it's going to be protected uh, if we can get the arithmetic correct, because, you know, it's not Democrats or Republicans that are putting these programs at risk. It's arithmetic. It's the numbers. Medicare is a tougher nut to crack than Social Security. 
because there's a couple different problems. One has to do with the relationship between payments coming in and payments going out. The other part of the problem with Medicare is the underlying healthcare delivery system, which is incredibly inefficient. You know, the concept is great. Medicare has done a lot to eliminate poverty among seniors. I mean, that's a, that's a tremendous success. Um, the problem is that it's been based largely on a fee-for-service system, third-party payer system, very inefficient ways to identify how care is going to be delivered and paid for. And that's why I'm one of the few people running for public office, even though I've opposed Obamacare and I believe that my number one priority when I go to Washington will be to repeal and replace Obamacare. I'm not just complaining about the problem, I'm offering an alternative solution called value-based health care, which will help to fix the way healthcare markets work in this country. Let me uh, ship. so Congressman, on the Medicare issue, should people, how do you think this is gonna, in the end, what is necessary to keep Medicare going? Uh, should younger generation Americans be expecting less benefits down the road? Uh, you know, just as Social <laughs> Security was not meant to do everything, it was supposed to be a, a tripod with, with pension, with personal savings, and Medicare to help take you through your non-wage earning years. Similarly, Medicare was not supposed to be a end-all and be-all. Uh, in many cases, even today, and by intention, it is supplemented with uh, private insurance. It's supplemented with personal savings, and it is supplemented by uh, healthy living habits to try to keep the cost down. With regard to Medicare, the big problem is not the arithmetic exactly. The big problem is the soaring cost of health care. There's no insurance program, public or private, that can stay in business if the cost of health care is going up at 5 or even 10 percent above the cost of living. So Aetna's books are private. You don't know how much trouble they're in or other private companies. Medicare's books are, are public. Actually, Medicare is doing better at keeping down costs uh, than the private sector. As, uh, as substantive as this has been, and it is my unfortunate duty to now say we've come to the end of this hour, uh, there's obviously lots more. Uh, and someday, hey, I'm an academic. I have no problem having a three-hour debate, but <laughs> that's just my future. Um, we are now at the point where we do our closing statements. Uh, in accordance with, again, a coin flip, uh, the first closing statement will be given by Congressman Holt. Thanks. Uh, I realized I, there's a couple of things that I forgot to say, and one is with regard to the value-added health care. Um, this idea of having health care directed more toward quality of health care delivered uh, rather than procedures offered is, is a good idea. But what it actually comes down to when you look at the, the, the details of Mr. Beck's, uh, Mr. Porter's, and others' programs is value-added health care equals vouchers. Vouchers is not the way to go with Medicare. Um, I also realized that I should have said something uh, about Solyndra. When I talked about the importance of the federal government where we can help investment move forward, uh, he said, oh, uh, what a boondoggle that was. Yeah, Solyndra failed. That was a failure. That was a bad company. He's been in risk management, my opponent has been. Uh, yeah, when you're talking about new companies, there's risk involved. But 23 of those 26 companies in the Solyndra-related program are doing quite well, thank you. Uh, yes, some of them s failed. That's why the federal government was involved, because the private sector wasn't willing to take that risk and yet we had a social need to move ahead with these energy programs. Um, I want to come back to my basic point, which is the American dream should belong to everyone. Stated in another way, as, it's, as you heard recently, this country is built from the middle out. That's what the American dream means. It's not that a few people do well and by, by, by extension or trickle down, uh, you will too. No, it is that the, this country uh, invests in education for all. They have job programs for all. They have environment protected for all. Um, and that's, that is, you know, deep, a deep value for me that comes from my, the social imperative that I get both from my parents, my mother who's here, Thank you. Uh, and okay. from uh, my uh, uh, values background. Thank, Thank you, you, Congressman.
your closing statement, Mr. Okay. Beck. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank the Rebovich Institute and my opponent for being here today. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of this debate, uh, I said that uh, I'd never seen this country more divided than it is today, and I recalled some of the comments that I, uh, from a, an individual I met many years ago that I think might help shed light on where we need to go in the future. Um, this was someone that I had a great deal of respect for and had the chance to work for. And he once told me that uh, you, you cannot be pro-jobs and anti-business at the same time. You can't love employment and hate employers. Everything we hope to do depends upon an expanding economic pie, and only a vibrant, competitive, and thriving private sector can create that. Only, pr only the private sector can create the revenues we need for the programs that we consider important. And the financing of those programs through ever more public debt, as my opponent has advocated, violates our generational responsibility. I cannot imagine those words coming from somebody from the White House today or somebody from the administration. And truthfully, I can't imagine those words coming from anybody from the leadership, the progressive leadership of the modern day Democratic Party, including my opponent. Okay, but those words were spoken by a former Democratic U.S. Senator by the name of Paul Sanga, so I had the pleasure of working with or with the Concord Coalition, the Bipartisan Concord Coalition. Those words, in my view, are a benchmark against which we can measure how far to the left the Democratic Party, the modern-day Democratic Party, and its leadership have moved. And if you're an independent and you're a centrist, or even a, a, a conservative Democrat or moderate Democrat, and you're concerned about what our country looks like today, and you want change, you want to take it in a different direction, I would hope to encourage you to support my candidacy. And, and if I haven't made the case to you today, let me just offer you this. Think about the one most fundamental question that we can think about in this election this year. And that is, can't we do better than this? And I can assure you, uh, with my candidacy, we'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes our debate. On behalf of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics and Ryder University, please join me in thanking loudly the two candidates. Let me, let me just say that this was, a, this was a wonderfully, you saw a real distinction between, I think, our two candidates uh, and uh, each got an opportunity to, to talk about a number of issues. There are a number of things we did not get to talk about from Afghanistan to social issues and any other things, I encourage you to learn more about each of these candidates so that you can please vote in the upcoming election. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thank candidates. Thank you very much. Thank you.